It's the end of February and most of the racers are now well into the breeding season. We've got 20 chicks in the nest, but I'm still waiting on some eggs to hatch. Even then, some of the yearlings haven't paired up at all this year. But that's not a bad thing as I probably won't have room for many more anyway. Today I was meant to be on a loft visit for the new Racing Pigeon YouTube channel, Pigeon Racer TV. But after that was postponed, I decided to tend to some much needed jobs that needed doing around the lofts, namely improving the trapping system for this year. Genius I know, invented a tool, or makes tools to do this job. That is 96 degrees. So my plan is to upgrade the uh, trap that I've got at the moment because at the moment the, the birds are losing time. They're not clocking in until they go through the bob wires. Shall I tempt you in with some food? Will that do you? The rules basically state that the birds um, can't clock in once the loft is closed. So I've got to design a trap that um, basically when I close it and I'm not here, the birds can't clock in. But when I open it, they can clock in quicker than they are doing now. It's 96 degree because I've got a bit of a fall on that, um, on the current roof. Uh, and then it needs to go at least uh, 400 mil out. And then this is going to be about 500 mil. And then that will be whatever that works out at. I'll draw that up. I reckon around. 400 and what's this one this is 350 mil that'll be around 400 mil and then hopefully what i'll do is this will open out to make a nice big landing board um, and then i will paint that a nice bright color and then under here is where the trap uh, the pad will go the sensor so in the pigeon let's draw a bird that's my bird oh, come on i can do better than that there we go. What an artist. Lands there. It'll go through this way. This is the loft. And there's the um, bob wires. And when it goes in here, this is where the sensor is. It'll register. And then when I lock the loft, this will go back up. And then the bird won't be able to get in, which makes it legal. Trapping is basically how we get the birds into the loft and record their race finish time using a sensor pad and a microchip that the birds wear on their leg. You can buy ready-made traps, they just bolt straight to your loft. No doubt better design than mine, but any excuse to save cash and I'm there. fact that I'm painting the hinges. This is not what you should be doing when you've got a hernia, but there we go. I'm impatient. Let that dry and then give it another coat. Now I'll put another one that side. And I might even block that middle bit off so they can't land on that. Trap for that section, trap for that section. Luckily I've built Another one for the cocks, the old bird loft. And here is my second one. This one's got a, a bigger landing board. So it sticks out a little bit more, make that nice and bright so the birds can see it as they come in. Um, and I'll put that on top of there because I'm fed up with that system that I've got. Let's get painted. That night I went online and came across something that nobody wanted to see, but probably what we all should have expected, and I was clearly mulling the politics over the next day whilst preparing the young bird loft for what looked like a bumpy season ahead. Bergs of manure. 
available for your plants. Pretty sure they used to use this stuff for gunpowder. Concluding that imitating Guy Fawkes was probably a last resort, I thought I'd be more reflective on the situation fanciers in the UK were finding themselves in. Right, so I wanted to um, quickly talk about the RPRA. Uh, they've increased their fees, I think it looks like anyway, from social media, it looks like they're increasing their fees, membership fee to £35 per um, year. But I just wanted to see what was being done about the future of the sport. And my concern is this, not 35 quid. I don't think 35 quid is much money at all. Um, but I think from somebody, from a newcomer, um, looking at the accounts the last couple of years, it's obvious that they're losing loads and loads of money and they're going to continue to lose loads and loads of money unless they do one of three things, I guess. They either increase the fees, the subscription fees, they increase the number of participants or they uh, reduce the outgoings. You can't expect the RPRA to continue functioning the way that it has done because there's an economy of scale. Um, so 15 pounds a year or 10 pounds a year might have been plenty 10 or 20 years ago or whatever it was accounting for inflation. But now um, there's a fraction of the amount of people that used to race. It's obvious, I think it was obvious to me that they were gonna have to increase um, the fee. If it was 100 quid, I don't know. I don't think that's really that much money when you consider how much money goes into pigeon racing. The issues, I guess, come along when you try to work out what's being done for that. This is, this, I've told a few people this. When I first started looking at racing pigeons, I went onto Google and I typed how to get into racing pigeons, how to start racing pigeons, all that sort of stuff. Now, if I'd have gone onto Google and I'd typed holiday in Mallorca, the very next time I'd gone onto Facebook or Instagram or any other web page, I'd have been bombarded with advertisements and information telling me how to go on holiday to Mallorca. When I did that with pigeon racing, I was putting a lot of effort into reading up on it. There was hardly anything. Uh, there were no cookies, nothing followed me around. Nobody was remarketing to me. And I think that's the biggest trick that the RPRA are missing. I mean, I know that there's a lot of um, money going in, and then there's a, but there's more money going out. Uh, and those two things just don't marry. So um, they don't balance. Uh, and I think that's important to try and get that right. I've made it a bit of a mission of mine to promote pigeon sport as best I can. And up to now, I've shied away from the politics of it. Then I received a message from a couple of guys asking if I'd be willing to interview them because they had something to say on the issue. This, I thought, would be perfect for the Pigeon Racer TV channel. So, at risk of ruffling some feathers, I arranged an interview with the former CEO of the RPRA and former vice president. Right, now, uh, I'm aware this discussion might sound like a bit of an echo chamber, and um, I've reached out to the RPRA to get their take on the situation and I'd love to go and visit them to find out what they're doing for the future of the sport but so far I haven't had any response so um, I'm going to keep working on that. Two thirds of the viewers of this channel aren't in the UK so this might not necessarily be relevant to them but from the conversations I've had with fanciers that are outside of the UK this might be more familiar than you'd think. So here's a few snippets of that conversation. It's an hour long um, so you can watch the full discussion if you go over to the Pigeon Racer TV YouTube channel. Subscribe to that if you like. It might be a little bit doom and gloom uh, in this episode, but I've got some really exciting things that I want to be working on uh, going forward for the season ahead. Uh, some loft visits, uh, some race uh, reviews, and also some live streaming on race days. So uh, yeah, like and subscribe that channel for sure. Uh, here we go. Ooh. Hi, Ian. How you doing? How's it going? Yeah, right yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Don't know how good the quality of this will be. But, um, right, so um, basically, as far as I know, I'll, I'll just have a quick in, talk about what, I, what the, the frustration I've got. And then you guys have got the knowledge in the background to sort of correct me. And a lot of people, you've seen all the comments and stuff that people have been putting about uh, on social media, I'm sure, in your own conversations. Um, but so, from as far as I can tell, as a, as a novice, um the rpra are running out of money it basically looks like the amount of money coming in is less than the amount of money going out but that's not a new thing and uh, and that probably should have been picked up well i certainly looked at it and, and i think the first time i spoke to you guys was about this time last year maybe just a bit longer to ask yeah. these very same questions where's the future of the sport because it looks like there's the hemorrhaging money uh at the rpra and what can be done about it and um, and then here we are a year later, and it doesn't look like anything actually has been done about it. So 
um, you know, you guys wanted to talk about what uh, what's happened uh, and the decision making processes and, and just clear a few things up. So uh, I'll hand it over to you. Go yeah, on. just to give a bit of background. So up until probably this year, I was a, an RPRA councillor, being an ex vice president as well. Basically, it's been say they've been saying the same things for 10 years and there's been no real action because I think maybe the British home and world has been disguising the fact that obviously the losses have been occurring for such a long time. I just think that the members like to sit back and just say, oh, someone else will do it, someone else will do it. And the past 10 years has shown that you know, someone else isn't going to do it. They can't do it by themselves. Obviously, it's wrong, I think, to direct all the criticism at council because it's not their fault. They are tied by a system that's outdated. Yeah, I, I think generally I feel the same as you, although I'm a bit more critical, really, of non, not per se council, um, but the structure in terms of the regions. I mean, I think we have to accept that the membership haven't been engaging in the regional structure for such a long time. The British Omen world, really, and the profits that over the years have been generated at the British Omen world have masked the issues, the financial issues at the RPRA, because they've always, to a certain degree, reported a profit in the consolidated accounts. So the consolidated accounts of the British Home World and the RPRA combined, they don't, they never publish, and that's a council decision, they never publish a breakdown of how both those entities are doing, which are, if, that, if, if they had, it would have been clear to everybody what we knew, that the RPRA for years and years and years has been losing money, and it's only the British Home World has kept it afloat, because we we were forecasting and could quite clearly see that it was a matter of time before the British Home World would no longer mask those losses. Um, what, were, what were some of those uh, recommendations that you put to, to move the RPRA, RPRA back into uh, profit, or at least breaking even? Well, we, we we'd or, I'd, I'd already made come a, you know I'd already made a couple of propositions to council to kind of take some of the existing services online. And I mean, the biggest the biggest thing there is the transfers. I mean, you used to have a person sat there every morning typing in transfers. That person was employed to do that. And actually, when you look at it. The cost of the transfers was two pound a sheet, and we were losing money because there was two first-class stamps involved in that. Then sending out to the the vendor and the new owner, and the person's time involved. So it was quite obvious that that kind of aspect of it was losing money. And we changed, we we, we put out the free online transfer version, which was very successful, very well, very well received by the membership. So so why can't subs just be paid online, like a, a Shopify store or some sort of e-commerce store where you just log on and type your details in? pay it and it's done i did it i did introduce uh, an online system to pay your subs um probably a few months before i left and I, since i've left it's been it's been removed because if you take that responsibility from the regions directly right. into hq why do you need the regions okay so john do you agree with that that it's um that it's it's the, the majority of the workload is in subs and and, and that financial side yeah yeah ab ab absolutely you know and as i say i am I am a region secretary, so I'd probably have a vested interest, but I would quite happily give up the role of region secretary if it was taken in-house. The general consensus, like you said, uh, Ian, when you did your um, poll of, of what people want and then what actually happens um, through the regions isn't necessarily representative of, of, the, of the fancy uh, at large. Um, and I, and I can I, and these issues with the communication and with the one member one vote and doing things online, and I can see some people are just not going to be for that maybe selfishly thinking well i'm only going to be racing for a few more years so i don't care after that point and and not thinking ahead so uh, maybe that might be pessimistic of me why has this been brought as, through as emergency legislation when it was quite clear to somebody like me a year ago that things were going to have to change it doesn't take a year to get to grips with uh, the financial situation you don't have to wait for those end of year accounts you should have management accounts at least that give you a rough idea of what's going on what the situation is my concern is the ceo report that's come in the latest british home homing world is the first inclination of any of these issues out of every episode how many how, how many of these it's uh, 52 of these that go out a year and this is the first one i've seen that's saying we've got an emergency we need to do something about it and, and I feel like that probably should have been done way earlier uh, and, and at least maybe even just pave the way to a fee increase and get a better sounding because it, now it feels a little bit rushed. And that's why people, nobody really cares that it's 35 quid. The 35 quid's nothing. It's the fact that it's going to be 35 quid this time as a rushed through thing 
it just doesn't make it doesn't look like it's going to solve it we're going to be back <laughs> here again potentially in another 12 months it's literally a very defensive um report uh, uh that says look these are all the problems that we've had if i don't get to see accounts that that sort of give a good reflection of the business you can't make a decision on it you can't make any informed decisions if you don't have the information and, and then if you're asking the fancy to make decisions or at least accept decisions that have been forced on you you still need to back it up with something this announcement of the increase in subscriptions has maybe woke a lot of people up here because now it directly affects each and every individual change in the rpra via the members is easy it's as simple as go into your club meeting go into your region meeting and instructing your region councillor to go to council they have to by power of mandate vote how the region wants you to vote so if every single region wants change change has to happen because there's your majority vote you know if, if i put a proposition forward to say we want to resurrect the whole report and we want to implement what you know i go to my club get it to the region get it through to the region and then it goes to council right the members only have to go to their club meeting and their delegate goes to the region meeting and if enough people want change change happens 